over this presentation, we have the pleasure to welcome Ilona Longvenova, which uh, she will try to answer the question, how should we view human responsibility with increased automation? Uh, Ilona has a Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University with a joint major in economics and philosophy, and her Juris Doctor from the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. Today, she is Associate General Counsel at McKinsey and Company within McKinsey G Digital, working closely with advanced anal analytics, AI, cloud stat strategy and enablement, and digital transformation across a range of industries. Have a good conference. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Alona Logvinova. I am a technology lawyer, as um, I was introduced so kindly. I am part of McKinsey. I work within McKinsey Digital. And you know what really energizes me is thinking about emerging technology, where we're headed, what it means from an ethical perspective, what it means from a legal perspective, and really thinking about it in a very cross-disciplinary way. Um, prior to McKinsey, I was a technology lawyer at MasterCard for a number of years. And before that, I started my career as a finance lawyer, actually. So I've, I've shifted around a bit, but landed in technology, which is something that I'm really excited about. So I am a technology lawyer, but at heart, I'm very much a philosopher who's always in search of truth. Um, as an undergraduate at Columbia University, I was an indulgent student of philosophy, and I still very much carry that inclination with me today. So I think you'll see that come through in the presentation. Um, in my work in the field of technology law, which is you know sh changing and shifting pretty quickly, there's not really a settled body of law. There's not a treatise per se in technology law. Um, I've had the privilege of working with some of the nuanced cross-disciplinary, ethical, legal, and regulatory issues around emerging technologies. And what's fascinating to me about the emerging technology space at this point in time is that the law is consistently trailing technology. And moreover, there's not really a single source of truth in terms of the dividing line between what's legal, what's true, what's ethical, and what's right. One of the more interesting examples that brings this to life, at least for me, is the trend that we're continuing to see of how humans are developing into physical beings who have machine qualities. Now, this may sound far-fetched far or futuristic, but just think about it for a moment. How often do you find yourself with your cell phone in your hand so often that it maybe can be argued that our cell phones are almost becoming like an appendage, like a part of us in some sort of way? And how many of us have tried any sort of augmented reality or virtual reality technology or any sort of smartwatch or wearable tech that tracks our bodily rhythms and movements and then gives us recommendations, right? It says, we're not taking enough steps. You should be taking more steps that, that day. And it really becomes sort of a part of your anatomy. And even more in depth, how many people might have technologies that are already embedded directly under their skin by surgical implant or into their bodies, whether it's a pacemaker or even more novel, a form of brain computer interface with BCI, which is becoming increasingly popular. We see that with Neuralink and other companies that are developing that kind of tech. And that allows our thoughts to be translated directly into speech to infer action, right? So our thoughts can then direct action through a computer, through AI. And if we think about these technologies holistically and about what they ultimately do, can we really recognize a dividing line between the sense of conscious personhood that belongs to us that we're ultimately responsible for and separate it from the consistently advancing force of technology that aims and purports to augment our experience, our potential, our capabilities, and ultimately our humanity. There's a term, interestingly, that's been ascribed to the increasing blend of humanity with machine qualities, and that's the word cyborg. It's a combination of cybernetics and organism, and it describes an emerging hybrid operating of machines and of humanity combined. The term was coined in, 18, in 1960, and it was meant to, the, to refer to the conception of an enhanced human being. Essentially, this term aims to explain the, the sort of existential duality that we're all living in today by acting in such close concert with machines in our everyday life. And as the tech-enabled augmentation of daily life normalizes, society seems to become increasingly more comfortable with tech not only being a part of our lives, but being a part of us as individuals and as humans in a deeply integral way. And so the really interesting question is, 
How do we think about that from a philosophical, sociological, anthropological, and legal perspective? From a legal perspective, as a lawyer, which arguably can be seen to inform the other dimensions, there was an interesting case example around this under US law in 2014. In June of 2014, the Supreme Court handed down its decision in a case called Riley v. California. And this was a landmark US Supreme Court case where the court unanimously held that the warrantless search and seizure of digital contents of a cell phone during an arrest is unconstitutional. Now, when the case came up for judicial review by the Supreme Court, it was actually a combined two cases that had very similar issues, not fact patterns necessarily, but issues. And they went up on appeal, and ultimately the Supreme Court decided to review both cases. And where they came out was to say that data that's on cell phones, right, you can't search that without a specific warrant. In each case individually, what happened was there was, in one case there was a traffic stop, in another case there was a defendant who was considered for a crime. But in both instances, when the police searched the actual cell phones of those two different defendants, um, they, they found evidence that then implicated a significantly greater crime. So in one instance, they found cell phone data in, with photos of that, of that person being in a gang. And that then linked that person to a gang killing that happened a week earlier. And of course, you can imagine linking that person to a killing increased the sentence significantly. In the other case, they found the address of the person and they found various data that led to a house that that person lived in. They then went to that house and they found you know, um, narcotics and a number of other things in that house and then arrested the individual. But in both cases, had they not had access to that digital data on those cell phones, they wouldn't have had, you know, the, they wouldn't have had the reason to suspect those individuals for those crimes. So in this case, the combined cases that were under review from, for the Supreme Court, the justices ruled unanimously that police officers cannot, without a warrant, search the data on a cell phone that's seized during an arrest. And writing for eight justices, Chief Justice John Roberts declared that modern cell phones are now such a pervasive and insistent part of daily life that the proverbial visitor from Mars might conclude that they were an important feature of human anatomy. Importantly, too, he wrote in the same opinion that modern cell phones are not just another technological convenience. With all they contain and all they may reveal, they hold for many Americans the privacies of life. The fact that technology now allows an individual to carry such information in his hand does not make the information any less worthy of the protection for which the founders fought. And so the point is, if our legal system sees each of us as, as, as phones, as a person using a, a machine, right? So if we're seen as people who use a machine, but they're two different things, this framing allows protections for one entity, which is the person, but robust protections for one entity, the person, may be nullified in the absence of matching protections for the other, which is technology. So for example, by protecting our data for surveillance. We've come quite far in our jurisprudence now in the recognition of privacy rights, particularly after the effectiveness of GDPR, which I'm sure we've all heard of. But with region, and regions and jurisdictions globally are now emulating GDPR and they're passing their own versions of what we see as privacy laws. Some are state level, some are federal level, but we're now seeing increased amounts of privacy legislation coming down. And so when we think about all of this taken together, maybe rather than seeing a, a binary legal distinction, seeing someone or something as a person or property, and understanding how integrated we are with technology and our day-to-day -day life, maybe the law should evolve to see more of a continuum where devices are integrated with the personhood of their owner, right? Because they very much are part of us today in the way that we live our lives. And that would be more reflective of the sort of cyborgs that we're all becoming and that we're all emulating and becoming today. And this kind of evolution in the law would benefit our emerging jurisprudence. But it seems like there's also a crucially important point here about it benefiting the development and the trajectory of technology. Particularly with the way that AI is developing 
and we're increasingly seeing AI starting to act autonomously in the sphere of traditionally human action that would be closed off to machines. So for example, in the military context, we're seeing autonomous weapon systems. In the transportation space, we're seeing the rise of autonomous vehicles. And more personally, from a pretty crucially human perspective, we're also starting to see the rise of actual robots who can respond to humans and relay what, it feels, what feels like true human emotion. And with the rise of these machines, how do we capture the responsibility, the liability, and should something go wrong in the way that they, or arguably we, behave? The, the more troubling one for me is the military context, because it, there, we're already starting to see the proliferation of lethal autonomous weapons. And what these are, they're basically lethal devices that have been empowered by their human creators, right, those who created the AI, to survey their surroundings, identify potential enemy targets, and independently choose to attack those targets on the basis of sophisticated algorithms. Autonomous weapon systems dramatically shift the identity and the potential for loss of life on the side of the party using them, right? Because they're machines who can act to take life, but because of what they are, they're machines, they're not actual human beings, there's not a risk of loss of life on their side. And in the words of the Harvard Political Review, if a country can fight wars with ruthless, ruthless efficiency, accurately pick out terrorists from hundreds of feet in the sky, and spare the lives of thousands of soldiers, why wouldn't it do so? Lethal autonomous weapons are being introduced into military arsenals, and countries including the United States, Russia, South Korea, Israel, and the United Kingdom have shown some interest in their development. The use of these weapon systems would significantly lower the threshold of going to war and dramatically decrease the costs of war, at least from a human life perspective, thereby potentially, maybe, increasing the likelihood of conflict. And so the question to ask, ask ourselves is, are autonomous systems, i.e. AI-powered machines, and cyborgs to be held liable for their wrongdoing? And if so, to what extent? Philosopher Robert Sparrow argues that the autonomy of these types of systems makes it impossible to hold anyone accountable for illegitimate killings that they commit. The logic is, if the robot acted truly autonomously, then liability and accountability can't be traced to another agent, right? You can't just trace it back to someone who's not that robot because it's that robot acting. And that wouldn't be right from either a moral or a legal standpoint. And then we might end up in a world where unjust taking of life isn't punishable, and we're facing a sort of liability debt in society where something happens that's clearly wrong, right? It's morally unobjectionably wrong, but it's not clear who should take responsibility for it. One element that seems to interject pretty importantly into this conversation is the emerging body of law and the guidance globally around responsible and ethical use of data and AI. We're seeing this with regulation recently that's coming out of the EU with the proposed EU AI regulation that came out last year, but also in other parts of the world to varying degrees, either through frameworks or agreed principles and best practices, even if those standards don't yet rise to the level of regulation, we're seeing industries coalescing around a variety of principles around AI. And I'm sure many of us have heard the buzzwords, right? Transparency, accountability, explainability for the fair and accountable use of AI. But of course, AI principles are also heavily rooted in data because AI is powered by data and it needs data to run. And so then it becomes important to understand the shifting and emerging landscape of privacy legislation and how data and ethics are protected. And we of course saw the introduction of the GDPR which happened in 2018 and it became effective. More recently, China also enacted its first data privacy law which is called the Personal Information Protected Law or PIPEL, which became effective in November of 2021, just last year. And with this law, with PIPEL, China's cybersecurity law and data security law, these laws are forming their governing system with cyber data security and basically their data governance framework in China. And PIPEL is similar to GDPR and it includes um, similar approach in terms of anonymized data, meaning that it's not deemed personal data. 
delineated concepts of data controller and data processor. We're also seeing that in the, in the China law. Extraterritorial reach, consent to process personal data, and limitations on cross-border data transfers. We're also seeing private rights of action, which is reminiscent of GDPR. In the US, interestingly, there's not currently a federal privacy law, but we are seeing a variety of activities across the states, and it's thought that there may be a privacy law that comes down you know, more immediately or within the next several years. But we're seeing state laws that are probably going to you know, be coming down this year, probably around eight states or something to that effect. And it's important to remember that the hallmark data protection law that paved the road for so many of these laws that we're talking about now was GDPR. And it was <clears throat> made effective in 2018. But it's really important to remember that it was first introduced in 2012. And so thinking about it that way, before the law ultimately became effective in, in 2018, it took a number of years for it to be made into law, right? So we had that stretch of time where it wasn't made into law yet, but organizations were starting to act in anticipation of this becoming law to avoid falling into a sort of regulatory debt when it did ultimately happen. And it seems like we're seeing something pretty similar happening right now with AI regulation, where the time horizon to effectiveness may be five to seven years, but even in the absence of a governing law, right, a governing statute around AI, we're seeing organizations that are basically reaching a common denominator of principles that they're choosing to adhere to for the benefit of society, for ethical best practices, but also in an anticipation of avoiding that sort of regulatory debt that they will ultimately fall into if the products that they design and deliver don't align with the regulations that ultimately come down. And so right now, the regulatory frameworks and emerging governing and guiding schemes say that AI should at the very least be fair, it should be easy to understand, it should be accountable, and it should defer to human decision making. Guidance, and this is guidance that public and private organizations are both coalescing around. So we're seeing industry norms, best practices, right? We're seeing corporations that are really investing heavily in not only framing these practices, but also implementing them and putting them into action. We're seeing ethics boards, right, cross-disciplinary panels of colleagues within organizations and externally to organizations that are coming together and trying to determine whether the AI that they're creating is fair and ethical and accountable and explainable. And it's interesting, too, in the AI and machine learning space, one potential legal and risk mitigation tool is the avoidance of closed loop systems. And that means that it, a closed loop system is a system that acts on its own, right? So it can make a decision and it can implement that decision. An open loop system is when you have human oversight that oversees that AI that ultimately takes action. And basically, advanced analytics with decisional output that are programmed to act directly without any human oversight that's what a closed loop system is. And we're not seeing too much of that today, but in the autonomous space, that's where, that's where this really shines. That's where that concept really has some teeth. Um, the guardrails around closed loop, closed loop tech builds aim to ensure the safety and security of those using the technology, right? And they work to put the human in the driver's seat. And the idea is if you, human being, have the decision-making rights over whatever the AI is doing, we're in much better hands. And that, that's basically done you know, by saying that mitigates the liability argument. Because if there is ultimately someone in the driver's seat who has human oversight, then we can trace back the liability and we don't fall into that gap that we were talking about earlier in the presentation. But the question is, is that enough? And when we think about personal responsibility and increasingly in the world that we ourselves are racing to build, how do we reconcile the growing jurisprudence around cyborg law and a, continu a continuum of protection for the machine qualities that we as humans are increasingly have and the liability for pu pure machine behavior by autonomous AI? Who has the responsibility for bad actions 
or inadvertent programmatic errors when something should go wrong? Is it the developer? Is it the person in charge of pulling the data sets? Is it a group of people entirely? Or do we step back and maybe we consider that maybe autonomous systems might exist entirely outside of our existing jurisprudence? A pretty scary thought for someone like me. Um, asking the question another way, how do we set ourselves up to live in a world without liability and responsibility debt? From a philosophical perspective and <clears throat> from an ethical foundation, it doesn't follow that autonomous systems can be entirely lawless. Because they take action, and where an action has consequences, it ought to be that those actions are met with an appropriate response. Deeper still, there's a societal perspective, right, of asking how we as a society ought to shape the future that we're living in and continue to build. <clears throat> with the understanding that autonomous systems will increasingly for form a part of our lives, how can we meaningfully capture their responsibility and liability? And by extension, how can we carry that same understanding of responsibility over to ourselves in this moment in time? As the cyborgs we are, making sure that the law gives us adequate protection for both our human and machine qualities, but also sets an appropriate framing for assigning liability. Thank you. So thank you very much for this talk. I think it's very uh, on the nose of uh, everything that this Congress is putting to light, uh, in which technology is going very, very fast. But uh, maybe, like we're talking about the social, that's not really following at the same pace. But now also maybe the laws that you didn't say that they were behind. So I guess that's good. But maybe like we should consider another way of viewing our laws. So we talked at the beginning that we were searching for the truth, but maybe uh, there is no single truth to see what's right and ethical about AI. And technology is becoming more and more parts of uh, us, the human, so from the, the cell phone that is an extent of us and also our, pri our privacy, uh, to some technologies that are being implemented directly in our bodies. Uh, so it's really becoming part of our, not only our lives, but also us as individuals. Uh, which led us to the term cyborg, which is an emerging hybrid between uh, machine and human. We then talked a bit about the legal aspects of uh, mod modern cell phones that are uh, actually pervasive and becoming part of almost our human anatomy uh, because they hold our privacy and hence uh, this privacy and even us, the person, are uh, being... Uh, being maybe not protected if there is no laws to, to protect this privacy. Uh, so it's not so binary anymore, so it's not the cell phone and the person, but it's both of them together that should be viewed more as a continuum and not just as the technology, the human. And then we also talked a bit about the automatics weapons that shifts the accountability and liability. And then we asked ourselves, if we should uh, hold them liable for their actions, and to what extent. So even if uh, these laws are not here yet, uh, we suppose that they might be here in five to 10 years, maybe you said eight, and then uh, that companies are already anticipating uh, their, the laws that are coming and trying to align their actions with the possible regulations that are gonna be coming. So they need to, the laws that they're setting themselves uh, to do is uh, fair, easy to understand, accountable, and differ to human decisions making. And that last point is quite important uh, because we talked about the avoidance of a closed system, so a, a system that would have no human oversight. And then uh, if there is no human to make the decision to be in the driver's seat, uh, there's a gap in liability and responsibility. So who's responsible? Uh, we don't really know if it would be the developer, or the people who put the data in the machine. And what we learned is that there is no really jurisprudence yet. And autonomous system cannot be lawless because they do take actions. So we concluded to say that uh, we, we shouldn't have a closed uh, system, right? There should always be a human responsible uh, for everything. So I'm gonna end the, this talk with a, a, just before we applaud our, our, our conference or conference room? 
speaker uh, one last time, I want to tell you that uh, there's a performance outside on the left of the campus, and the performance is by an artist. I think he's like a, a painter. He's called Lapin, and it will speak of uh, brainstorming with, with uh, an AI. So thank you very much for this conference.